Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Ames Public Library, both in person and virtually, for How to Write Funny, an introduction to short form humor writing. Uh, this program is brought to you through a partnership with Ames Public Library and the Iowa State University Writing and Media Center. My name is Kathy Cooney. I'm an adult services librarian here at the library. And our mission is to connect you to the world of ideas, which we do through diverse and inclusive resources and programming, like our event tonight. Um, if you get bumped out of the Zoom meeting, just follow the original link to get back in. And we've enabled live captioning. So if you don't see captions and want them, you can turn them on by clicking the live transcript button. Um, it's the big CC in the menu bar and then selecting closed captioning. Um, we will also, as you have seen, be recording the session and we'll post to the YouTube channel after the event. And we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Rachel will take care of all of your queries. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> all of them. Just to introduce tonight's presenter, uh, Rachel Manson Kenny is the assistant director of the Writing and Media Center at Iowa State University. She also writes fiction, like The Butterfly Effect, which is this year's All Iowa Read title, and Essays in Humor, and has been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, and McSweeney's, among other publications. So, with that, I'm going to mute our in person folks and turn it over to Rachel. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And poor Kathy is, is direly understaffed tonight. So thank you for doing uh, triple duty over there, Kathy. <laughs> okay, so tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about how to write short form humor or how to include humor of all kinds into any kind of work that you're doing. Um, the idea of humor writing can be kind of daunting for people because they, they worry that if people aren't laughing out loud, then they're not succeeding. And luckily with humor writing, that's not usually the goal. The goal with humorous writing is to make people think about something in a different way, to show a new perspective and to make people feel amused. Humor can also be really useful when you're writing things that are extremely serious to add those moments of levity. Even think about in Shakespeare's time, there were usually the roles of the fool in his work uh, to help offset the serious tones of his tragedies. So that's the last I'm going to say about Shakespeare today. Uh, I think I have one other reference, maybe. Maybe that's a lie. <laughs> but other than that, uh, today we're going to be talking about how to think about humor, so different types of humor that there are in any kind of media. We will um, not see any video examples because my audio is not working, but we'll talk about the examples that I brought forward. And then we have lots of examples of written humor that we're gonna to dissect to see what's working and how can we apply that to work that we wanna write for ourselves. So the first thing to think about is the more you know about humor, the easier it is to start writing it yourself. It sort of demystifies it a little bit and helps you look at it as something that you can help start to do yourself. So there are you know, several types of commonly recognized humor and these would be humor ideas that you would see in any form like movies, um, writing, in you know funny podcasts, TikToks, whatever. Uh, first we have physical humor and this works really well for those more visual mediums. Obviously that would be people slipping on banana peels or falling head over heels or the uh, you know any kinds of slapstick comedy that way. Next, um, self-deprecating humor, which turns the target towards yourself to make fun of characteristics or stories about your past. I do this all the time. I love to tell stories about how uh, I made bad decisions and people usually find that pretty useful. There's also surreal humor. So surreal humor takes things to a different level that isn't in touch with reality in any kind of way. It might be adding elements of the fantastical like zombies or monsters, or it might just be making something so weird it could not possibly happen. Improvisational humor is another thing that works better in live media where you work in a team um, or you're provided prompts that you make up on the spot and you have to go along with. Wordplay is things like puns or taking an idea and sort of twisting it and playing on a theme. Topical humor is things like The Daily Show, uh, where you're taking newsworthy topics and riffing on them. Observational humor is sort of the opposite of that, where you take a step back and you look at common norms of society that people may not have explored before. 
bodily humorous fart jokes, and all of the like, the weirdnesses of our human bodies, which is great in moderation, but it's one of those things that people max out on pretty quickly, um, unless you're playing to like my nine-year-old son, in which case like pour it on, he will take every single fart joke you have with relish. Um, and then finally, dark humor is where you hit upon those topics, which sort of could make people feel emotional in very positive and negative ways. You hit upon topics that might be so timely that they could be hard to manage, like doing jokes about, for instance, COVID-19. If that's something that you're still in the midst of, it's kind of difficult to find humor in. But also people appreciate those kinds of jokes um, in the moment too. It just depends their mood they're in. So I had an example for you. And we will watch the first couple seconds. Today, we're mainly going to be zooming into written humor, as I said. So we're going to be talking about how to create short form written humor that you can send to magazines or websites, or even if you are somebody who likes to do video things, these translate really well to mediums like TikTok. Um, where if you write something up, you write up the script, you figure out how to put in these aspects of different types of humor and build upon them, you can have very successful TikTok or YouTube content as well. But learning about how these pieces work is sort of essential to upping your game and improving what you're doing because you're more mindful of it. So let's talk today about some of the most common forms of short form humor. First, we have the personal anecdote. Um, and if you're on TikTok, that's usually called like hashtag story time. You know, people tell funny stories about themselves. There's reworking an existing form. There's monologues from character points of views, or there's lists. So I'm going to break down each of these parts. We're going to look at lots of examples of each. So you can see how you might take this form and explore with it. Um, so I'd like if you don't have a piece of paper handy yet to take out a piece of paper or, or if you're in the room at the library and you don't have paper, please grab your phone and open up a note because um, there are going to be moments for doing some brief brainstorming activities in just a minute here. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is personal anecdotes. You know, many of us love to tell stories about ourselves. Uh, we have funny stories about when we were kids or when we were in college or, you know, when we had kids, uh, whatever it is, there's usually a funny story we could share. So how do you actually know what anecdotes work well to share for other people besides your family to hear or other people besides like just telling at a party? Um, I write a lot of personal anecdote kind of work. And one of my pieces that had a lot of humor elements was able to get published in the Washington Post. And it was one of those things where in the moment when I was going through the experience, it did not feel very funny to me. I talked about a almost like nine months long reinfection of lice that my, my child kept getting. She kept bringing it home and it kept not being eradicated. So, you know, in the moment, it was a really awful experience, but then taking distance from that experience, I was able to personify the idea of this lice um, and, and make it sort of an, a battle that was more funny and that was able to translate well and that got published in the Washington Post. So there are lots of ways to get that emotional distance that's long enough to see the humor in something. Um, but then you also need to see like which stories are going to work best for your audience. Number one, if you're telling a personal anecdote, make sure it's your story to tell. Um, when you're working on humor, humor can be very personal. And so telling other people's stories, um, or if the story is not really you involved or you as the major character, take a step back and see if that's really your story to share or if that's really someone else's to share. When you're Telling a story, especially for humor purposes, it's okay to punch up the details using funny language. And I'll talk about an example in a minute here. So it's okay to exaggerate moments um, in a way that the audience can tell that they're exaggerated, where the audience is sort of in on the joke and they understand, oh, it didn't really happen exactly like this. This is like uh, silly language usage or details that you've expanded for, for you know, making it super funny. You want to make story make sure that the story is transferable or has a takeaway. So if it's just like 
an inside joke kind of story between you and your friends. And it was just a funny thing that happened that, you know, happened one time and you didn't really learn anything from it. And, oh, I guess you had to know the people or you had to be there. Those aren't usually the kinds of stories that work well for this. So you have to make sure that there's an angle of it that makes it so that a stranger on a bus could hear this story and get something from it, not just somebody who knows you personally. And finally, these kinds of stories always are much easier to write if the joke is on you. So like if you're the person who's made a fool of or you're the person who looks silly in this situation, it's so much easier to write um, because the power dynamics are not so weird and the audience doesn't feel uncomfortable. So the audience is much more likely to be with you to think something's funny if the joke's been on you and your silly mistakes than on you pointing out um, flaws in the system. Then it gets more serious or flaws with other people and then it gets more serious. So there's a really funny uh, story and I will link this in the post show email that I'll or post class email so that you can watch the whole thing. Um, but Mike Birbiglia is obviously a comedian. He's a wonderful storyteller. He does this for a living. So <laughs> you know that he has lots of practice with it. Uh, he has a wonderful story that he talks about going on a trip with his wife um, and the house that they happen to rent is infested with mice. So at its core, this seems like a very small moment uh, where it's like, oh, that's kind of a silly thing that happened. Like, what a weird thing. But he ends up being able to stretch this into a nine minute story by expanding the characters of his wife and his cat, um, by making the mice very large characters in this story, by digging into the language usage, by doing a lot of wordplay. Um, so it's, it's all in finding the details. And I'll tell you about some strategies for doing that in a minute here. One thing he does is he uses a lot of wordplay in this story and he talks about how they're taking their cat on this vacation to Massachusetts and they keep calling it Catsachusetts, which isn't funny except for it is um, because he knows how silly it is and the audience gets in on the joke. So, um, it's really believing in the story that you're telling and finding the details that are most meaningful to expand. So I want you to think briefly, I'm gonna give you three minutes here just to write three kernels of ideas of stories that are not just inside jokes um, and they don't even have to be huge moments, but that are small funny things that maybe you could think about expanding into humor pieces. So I'm gonna set a timer for three minutes here I want you to do a little free writing, sentences, words, or phrases, whatever is useful to you to start to get some ideas down.
All right, hopefully you have some kernels for ideas. I know it can be tricky, um, but there's also lots of good personal essay prompts out there. I know Summer Brennan's going to be doing a write week um, for personal essay writing next week. So I think she'll have some prompts included if you go to her newsletter. So Summer Brennan's on Twitter. I can link to her in today's follow-up as well. And that might lead you to some good prompts for thinking about some good essay topics. If you if personal essay writing that's humorous is in your, your future. Okay, so the next types of forms that we talk about are much more likely to be the types of things that you would see on humor websites specifically, like McSweeney's, um, you know, Tiny Shouts, Slackjaw, uh, the Belladonna, and I'll tell you about all of those later on as possible outlets for your work. But the next three types of humor that we're going to be seeing um, have very specific kinds of places that they work well. One of the most versatile and the most fun to think about is reworking an existing form. So thinking about genres of work or writing um, text of any kind that you come in contact with on a daily basis and then jamming another idea in into that to see what you can make of it. So it's basically like making a milkshake out of a text that you have and adding in lots of other fun stuff. So let's look at a couple of examples and then I'll show you some uh, thinking. We'll think through some other ideas together. So one example I really like came from last summer. Um, Alyssa Bassist is a wonderful humorist and Emily Flake. They had a piece in McSweeney's that, that copies those um, subscription emails that you get when you try to unscribe from a listserv. We're sad to see you go, but if you have a moment, will you tell us why you unsubscribed? Failure to do so will cancel your request. So they lay out the game right there in the beginning. Um, we all know what that feels like to go through the endless prompts at the end of those <laughs> um, emails. Uh, and then they just have a whole bunch of hilarious options for each of the questions below. Um, I'm unhappy with my choices. I'm making a mistake, but cannot help myself, which I plan to address in therapy one day, but not today, right? So the choices that they have are things you would absolutely never see. Um, so taking an existing form and reworking it. Another one would be a form that you would see is a college recommendation letter. So what would be a funny college recommendation letter to see? Well, what about Draco Malfoy's college recommendation letter, who is famously one of the weirder antagonists in the Harry Potter series. Um, so in lots of humor, the title almost completely gives away the game. So Draco Malfoy's college recommendation letter that I totally don't feel conflicted about writing whatsoever. Um, when you rework an existing form, the many as many parts of the form as you can keep intact so we can recognize it, the better off you are. So in this piece, one of the things that's wonderful about it is that it has all the forms of a letter, so the to whom it may concern. Um, it also has the formal tone that we're used to seeing in those recommendation letters. As director of college counseling at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, it is my unique privilege and contractual duty, <laughs> right? So it's um, finding the moments of agreement with the form, but then the contractual duty is twisting that, and that's not actually something you would say in a recommendation letter, and it shows the, the funny, reason behind the piece. So finding the happy medium behind keeping as much of the form as you can and twisting it is the great challenge and, and pleasure of writing these kinds of forms. Quizzes are another really common, fun kind of form, especially if you're starting out, having two options. And then at the end, you know, saying, okay, if you answered mostly A's, then you're this. If you answered mostly B's, then it's this. Um, that's a really fun thing to play with. So quiz, do you wanna to go to grad school or do you just need a snack? Um, notice here that just like in a good quiz, the questions are short um, and they're not just yes or no questions. They have some sort of direction to them. So they're a little bit open-ended there. Um, and then they clearly lead you to the answer that they're, they're going for there. Something we're also gonna talk about later is the idea of like specificity and focus on language. And a couple moments in this piece that I really like are my daily affirmations are I have, I do have descended from oil baron money 
And I do have descended from oil baron money. I totally do. And that's why I, I order delivery every day and I don't look at my credit card statements, right? So I had a piece recently that was in uh, the Belladonna, which is a humor website primarily for people who identify as women. And I wanted to do a wedding announcement piece for Prince Eric's wedding, um, because I always thought it would be really funny to have to have written a wedding announcement um, since he was supposed to marry somebody else, they would have had that all written up. So how many couples can claim their relationship began with saving a life? Prince Eric and not Vanessa. Ariel can, right? So I went through the whole piece with the editor's notes and the cross outs for the things that differentiated Vanessa and Ariel. And, and that was a really fun piece to work with. So I want you to brainstorm in the chat. We're going to type out as many ideas as we can think of of common forms of writing literally anything that you would see on a daily basis. We're going to see how many you can come up with. It can think about forms of text that you see in your job that are common. Um, maybe if you're a student, what are some common things that you're used to seeing? Or if you are just a person living their life, paying their taxes, all that kind of stuff. So I'll give you a couple minutes to put some things in the chat and we'll see what we can build here um, for brainstorming purposes. And I'll show you my list. All right, you're really starting to get into it now. So I'm gonna start reading them. Don't start type, stop typing. I will keep reading these for a little while. Agendas, phone texts, technical documents, social media posts, recipes, YouTube comments, reviews for hotels or bed and breakfasts, um, jokes, homework assignments, class syllabi, emails with lots of explanation like you might get from a boss, parents uh, yelling at you, nutritional information, newspaper headlines, magazine advertisements, closed captioning goofs, um, how-tos, scientific journal articles, diaries, uh, free promotional items that would be good for like a illustrated piece, directions, motorcycle rally warnings. That's really specific. Love it. Flyers. Excellent. So you're starting to brainstorm just thinking about all the different kinds of text that you see in a day. I'm going to show you some of the ones I thought of. Some of these are the same. So recipes, job postings, DMs, plays, poetry forms, letters or emails, newspaper articles, syllabi, exam questions, college entrance exam essays, manuals, invitations, literally anything. You can think about something that you see um, daily and think about what could you mix it up with to be funny. Um, one piece I didn't include as one of the examples, but that is absolutely hilarious, is a fake college entrance exam from the kid in Jurassic Park. And like the only thing that has happened to him in his life is that he escaped from dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, but he's trying to use like college entrance um, essay language to be like, my life was changed. And for some reason, like this connects to wanting to go to Cornell uh, because I saw a Tyrannosaurus, right? So the the weirder the mashup the more successful it usually is it works really well that way some of these types of things can be harder to find places for especially fake news articles are really hard to find places for because places like the onion uh reductress those have staff writers rather than accepting um like freelance writers or people just submitting so 
it's hard to find places for newspaper articles. Most humor outlets just specifically don't take them, um, but they are fun to write anyway. So it's still worth doing if it's of interest to you. These other ones, it's a lot easier to find places for if you do a lot of the other things that we're gonna talk about today about boosting that humor as much as possible. Okay, so we've got you thinking so far about personal stories. We've got you thinking about taking those forms and twisting them. Uh, now let's talk about another really fun thing to do, which in some ways is kind of a twist on a form, but more specific. And that's monologue from a character point of view that you don't usually see. So the most famous one has to be the zillion times shared McSweeney's piece. Um, I regret to inform you that my wedding to Captain Von Trapp has been canceled. So if you haven't read this one, it's an absolute classic um, talking about Sound of Music from the point of view of the rich fiance who got dumped. So <laughs> that's the absolute point of this kind of genre is to think about uh, a character in a movie, a book, TV show, or even in real life, whose point of view you don't often hear from and tell a story or backstory from that point of view. So here's another one. I'm William, William Henry Harrison. And it seems you've forgotten me again this President's Day. <laughs> and so it's all just in this hilarious language that sounds somewhat old fashioned, um, talking about William Henry Harrison, but then also talking about um, how funny the idea of President's Day is. For instance, it says, you know, every year on this hallowed holiday, I rise from my grave with a sense of hope. Perhaps this is the year when I too will be poorly impersonated by a local salesman promoting a blowout sale on horseless carriages. But alas, it seems that again, I am doomed for all eternity to be nothing more than a pub trivia answer that nobody can recall. So these uh, forms, this short monologue uh, from a strange point of view, this is the perfect place to explore the weird thing that you're obsessed with, whether it's a movie or a book that you've read a zillion times and to start thinking about it in different ways. So think about those movies and those books that you love or those TV shows. Um, whose perspective does the story actually focus on most of the time? Who are the characters we don't hear from? And what would they say about the story that we all know? I had a piece published in, published in McSweeney's last month about Mrs. Potts from Beauty and the Beast. And it was unresolved questions I have for Mrs. Potts. And it was a list of all of these really weird things, mostly about where did Chip come from? Like, how does that work? Was he born before he became a teapot? Um, you know, how, how did this whole process work? So, you know, finding those weird inconsistencies that have always bugged you in a story and exploring it that way, this can work really, really well for the form. There's even a whole section in McSweeney's Internet Tendency, which is one of the places you've heard me talk about a zillion times here because it's one of the biggest outlets for humor writing where these kinds of things are especially housed. Um, so you can find an easy uh, set of examples to read there. A couple of other recent ones from last year um, that show that it doesn't just have to be from a movie. It can also be just an item. This one's from the point of view of the ball pit at a like a fast food restaurant. Hey girl, it's me, the ball pit, can we talk? Um, so you can think even about objects or other things in your life that, you know, what would your house plant have to say about you as a person? You know, what does it notice about you? Uh, what does your dish detergent think about your food choices, right? So thinking about just random objects and what would they say? Like it's Blue's Clues or something and they can come to life. All right. The final major form we're gonna talk about is lists because these are another way that it's really great to get started. Um, it can be kind of an easy place to start. You don't have to build a lot of boning in between your humor items. Lists are literally that, they're lists. Um, why are lists funny? Number one, the form is simple. Number two, you can easily add elements to up the humor. Number three, pineapple. You can vary the length of the blocks of list items to add pacing and interest. Complexity on some list items make us focus more, read harder, and take in more information. Five, and then short again. So lists are really uh, 
fun to work on because they make you focus on the language very deeply and not so much about those other elements around it like oh did I get enough movie details does this look like an email etc like as long as it looks like a list you're doing it right so here's an example for you people who have accomplished incredible things at a young age taken down a peg um so it's basically him just listing the things that people did when they were young and then insulting them. That's all this list is. Wolfus Amadeus Mozart was only eight when he wrote his first symphony. I've never heard of it. I don't know anyone who has. And he keeps that consistent tone throughout the whole piece. Uh, I love Mark Zuckerberg started, Iceberg, started Facebook at 19 and has yet to apologize, right? So each of them has a consistent theme where it states the fact and then insults the person. And that's all it is for the entire list, keeps it consistent. Um, here's one from the New Yorker, a compiled list of collective nouns. Um, I love Mia Mercado, she's very funny. A group of ants is called a colony. A group of aunts is called a book club. A group of sparrows is called a host. A group of men named James is called late night hosts. So she tells you a real group uh, a real list of collective uh, nouns. And then she also tells you a fake one right afterwards, like she vibes on it. She works on something that sounds similar or made her think of it. And you're with her for each step of that process. Um, notice that these are not long, they're not full of a story, but they they flow together and they have a, a sense of, of pacing and of rightness um, for how they're composed. So those are the major types of humor writing. We have the personal anecdote, which goes very uh, in depth on a story and heightens that humor, focuses internally on that. We have our uh, twists on a form, we have lists, and we also have our monologues from an alternative character's point of view. So one of those hopefully will be interesting to you, one of them probably stuck out to you more. Um, and whatever it is, we have some more writing exercises near the end to help you boost that or to, to explore that. But I'm gonna go over some general humor writing rules to help you find success, no matter what form your writing takes, or even if you're using humor writing in fiction writing, um, play writing, or anything else that you're working on. So let's talk a little bit about best humor practices here. First, write what you know. Take those topics that you know really, really well and expand upon them. Go your nerdiest self, um, because I promise you somebody out there will find it as funny as you do. It might take you a little bit and some rejections, but you'll find your people. Don't try to explore topics just because they're in the news or just because everyone is into it. Um, you're not going to find success that way. Truly find something that you know and write about it. I think there's a really funny piece um, by Amy Collier. This is also in the New Yorker's Daily Shouts um, that is about, you know, it came from a place of her just having done so much online dating that she noticed the trend of a guy holding a fish in a dating profile. And this whole piece is just so funny from his imagined point of view. So I am a Tinder guy holding a fish and I will provide for you. The title gives a lot away there. I'm going to read a little bit of this to you just so you can see how she put it together. Photo one, behold my mackerel. I've caught it for you and it is for you to eat. Love me and I shall fill your dinner table with mini fish such as this one in days to come. During our time together, you will never go hungry or fear famine. You will never want for trout, salmon or otherwise. I will sustain you with my love and with my fish. And it gets weirder. <laughs> and continues to build, just like hitting this idea of fish home uh, in every single section. And like, why is this guy shirtless holding a fish? So find the thing that you notice is weird, uh, write it down in a note before you can forget about it. And then when you have time, go explore that idea, take it to its weirdest possible place, um, either from that person's perspective or in an unusual form and see where it goes. Number two, don't punch down. So just like when you're writing personal anecdotes and it's best to have the joke be on yourself, when you're writing any kind of humor piece, you wanna make sure to think about who has the most power in a situation and how you're using that power. So if you're 
you know, if the object of your joke is a marginalized group or a group of people with much less power, uh, it's not as funny. <laughs> it's uncomfortable for the audience to read. If I were to tell jokes making fun of a group of second grade children because they don't understand something, that's not funny, it's just mean. But if I make fun of myself because the children said something mean about me, that is funny. Like it's it's hilarious when my, my kids uh, say mean things to me uh, because I have the more power in the situation and it doesn't actually hurt my feelings, it's just funny. So being self-deprecating is always a good idea or speaking truth to power is always fine. So finding who has the most power in the situation, demonstrating that you understand those power dynamics and speaking in a truthful way about it. So I like this piece. This is from Slackjaw recently, which is another humor outlet by Adam Dietz. And he's just making fun of himself. So brutally honest writing bios, this is part of it. Um, you know, we're used to seeing writing bios that are full of all of this flowery language and all these awards and um, that he just focuses on uh, stuff that doesn't work. So Adam Dietz is a comedy writer whose work has been featured in a variety of websites that are inferior to this one. Here's a link to his poorly designed website. <laughs> Adam Dietz is a content writer who lives in Wisconsin. He chose this photo because it thought it made him look hip and friendly, two things he assuredly is not, right? So um, finding ways to make fun of yourself really works well. Um, these are a little bit two screenshots from places that do more news related humor on their Twitter feed. Uh, airlines announce it is safe to fly planes indoors again. This was making fun of, recently of removing mask mandates on airlines. So they're speaking truth to power for the airline industry and the CDC and all those dynamics politically involved. Another uh, one that is not really punching at anybody. It's just punching at the idea of, uh, you know, silliness of, of the system in general. Women reconsiders desire for success when she realizes she might have to wake up early, right? If that resonates with you because you also have felt that, <laughs> then it's almost punching at yourself and it helps the audience identify with it. Next, uh, I think we're on number three here for rules. Make it weird and make it specific. The, the surreal aspects can really come into play, especially as you're trying to amp up the piece the further you get along in it. You know, unfortunately, this is only an hour class, so we don't have time to talk about that build. But the, peer, the piece should get weirder and more specific and more in itself as you go along. And humor writing is pretty short. It's between usually 400 and 700 words, um, generally, for the pieces that I've published in the past. I mean, most places won't take anything that's even a 1,000 words. So you don't have a super long time to build up that humor. So you need each word to count as much as you possibly can. So finding the funniest or weirdest word um, really, really helps your audience get into that game more quickly. Here's an example. I think this was just published today in McSweeney's. Our hybrid work policy requires you in the office twice a week to battle the bog man. Um, so the language in here, it's a play on a form, right? We're used to those inter-office emails. They use a lot of the same kind of language that you would see in a businessy email, like innovative hybrid work policy, um, hybrid work schedule, employee burnout, sustainability, right? But then they're also making it weird and surreal by adding um, things like 40 hours in the office isn't sustainable in the modern workplace, especially when plagued by a vindictive bog man. After all, we're only human. Oh, how obvious that fact is compared to the ceaseless energy of the bog man. So finding the funniest uh, descriptors there, the sensory details um, or the really specific adjective use that helps us get in that moment works really, really well. Um, titles are almost everything in humor. A good title can help you land a piece. Uh, usually when you are submitting, you're not gonna get feedback on your titles. It just already has to kind of be good. So finding a very clear way to explain exactly what's going on, what's the game, what's the humor element, preview that for us very clearly in your title, um, that's perfect. 
uh, because if you don't give away that game, then we're not exactly sure what we're aiming for, uh, and it may not be read. So here's one. In, the first one uh, with the cupcake picture is from the Belladonna. Son, it's time you knew how your grandma and grandpa died at your gender reveal party. And you can tell it's going to be talking about like those firework accidents or something silly like that. The next one was in Slackjaw. Five little monkeys jumping on the bed experience the American healthcare system. You can see where that's going. It's going to be a play on uh, the five little monkeys uh, story. The third one here, women mentally rifles through friends for perfect person to sympathize with for current pettiness. And a lot of onions pieces, they literally are just headlines. Um, there's not actually a story attached. Sometimes it's just a picture. So uh, that is part of the, the deal here. And my son is knocking at the door. He currently is home. So I need to check on him. It'll be three seconds here. Pardon me. And I'm back. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> I knew he was going to interrupt me at least once. I feel, feel vindicated in that. <laughs> All right. Um, next, the, the game of the piece, which you've heard me re uh, reference a few times here, is sort of the internal logic that you invite your audience to listen for and be a part of with you. So what what is making this not just a string of jokes and also not just a straight story, but something that is sort of silly and fun that we're following along with you for. So this is an excerpt of a piece that I published in the Belladonna a few years ago, and it was called Hi from the Long Recipe Before, uh, sorry, Hi from the Long Story Before the Recipe on this blog. And it's just a monologue like what you would see before a recipe, except it's all about how this recipe website is tracking your data, stealing it, um, and also is going to be quizzing you in order to allow you to actually see the recipe that you're trying to get to. So it's sort of vindictive. So that's sort of what I wanted to do in the piece, but there's also this internal game being played where the story that I'm telling that I want the audience to read about is about great Nana and her arm wrestling racket. And it's something that you bring up several times and sort of have the audience follow along with. If your game is this idea of the bog man and you know the whole piece is about how silly it is to return to the office because there's still danger there, but the sort of joke of the piece is the bog man, then each time you bring up the bog man, you have to find a new way to heighten that humor, to describe him in a new way, to use different adjectives or to describe a different part of him so that we understand him. So whatever it is that you're doing, you need to continue to up that humor and amp it, play that game throughout the piece. Um, and also not try to introduce a whole lot of new other elements that aren't related. So if you already have the bog man and you're building on that, you don't also need to introduce uh, a zombie werewolf as well, right? So keep it consistent and build on the thing that you have, especially since you only have that 400 to 700 words to work with. So those are sort of the basic rules to think about. Um, the other basic one I would add is read a lot of humor. You'll make it, a, if you wanna write humor, you should be reading humor to help you see sort of what's out there, what are people doing that's funny, not to copy them, but to understand like, oh, I see the way that they played this game. I see the way that they did wordplay here. I see the way that they found a form to twist. Um, and it helps you understand and, and honestly, get ideas of your own that are unrelated to those. So finding places that you are interested in reading helps you find places that you want to submit to as well. One of the things I'll link you to in my follow-up email is going to be a list of lots of submission options. It's like a list of like a hundred humor outlets and some of them are extremely specific. Like if you write humor that's about music or if you write humor that's about 
uh, the fashion industry, you know, or if you're a teacher and you write humor, um, there's going to be more specific kinds of outlets, but a couple of really good ones to keep your, your finger on the pulse of. Um, McSweeney's is a good one, but it also is very competitive and hard to get into. I had 40 rejections before I had my first acceptance. So don't be afraid to be rejected a lot with humor pieces. That's just very common. It's part of the game. Um, check their submission guidelines because they are very clear about how they'd like you to submit to them. So, so they won't be reading cover letters. Uh, they just sort of want the top information, like your name, your email address, the title of the piece, and then literally the piece. You don't have to worry about anyone stealing your work there. Like literally that's not anything you have to be concerned about. It's just um, good to get someone's eyes on it. And they will let you know if they reject your piece at McSweeney's after at least a week or two. Points in Case is a medium-based uh, humor website. So is Slackjaw. The Belladonna is um, open to people who identify as women only. Funny-ish and Little Old Lady Comedy. Those are some really approachable uh, humor websites that you can start to look into to submit those really specific forms of humor. If you're writing things like personal essays that are funny, there's a much wider audience for those. You could look at any kind of magazine submission or local papers even sometimes, depending on how long those are. So those would be my biggest suggestions. Um, when you submit, you don't have to usually write a long cover letter for any of these kinds of things. You can let them know if you've been published before, but if you haven't, it's okay. Everybody has to start from somewhere. The key here is that the humor speaks for itself. So make sure it's the best work that you can make. Um, humor, when you submit it, it doesn't really get edited very much. People don't work with you to amp up the jokes or send it back for a round of, of, of um, feedback usually. So make sure it's as good as you can get, You know, let a few friends see it, make sure they think it's funny, get some workshop on it before you send it out. Okay, I'm gonna, I have a writing exercise here that you can, do, but I want to make sure we have time for questions first. So if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat, uh, or I guess we have a Q&A box. Um, so feel free to type those. And if you don't have questions, then you can start on the writing exercise. The I'll explain the writing exercise while you're getting a chance to type these things here. Often good humor comes from a place of being frustrated or noticing errors with something. So uh, an easy way to find a way into humor is to make a list of things that make you mad. Big things or small things. It can be, you know, that there's no oat milk at the grocery store or whatever, or it can be something as large as healthcare reform. It can be uh, the next, write it a list of 10 things that you know more about than other people. And then writing a list of five movies, TV shows, or books that you love. So later, you can think of headlines that are descriptive, like those titles. Show them to a friend and ask which ones make them laugh, and then actually turn those things into a piece. So later, you can see, you know, coming from that list, maybe Seinfeld is one of the TV shows that you love so much. Is there a piece that you want to explore from that? What would the lady who was called Manhands have to say about Jerry during that date? Um, you know, so thinking about those headlines and then where you might want to go from there uh, to decide if you want to write the piece. So I'll be quiet unless anybody types questions in the chat. Otherwise, I'll give you some time to write and then I'll let you know when our time's at an end if you don't have any other questions.
All right, well, I'm gonna stop the recording since I don't think anyone has any questions. And, oh, for the list of 10 things we wanna know more about. Is that the writing prompt itself? Yes, that's meant to generate topics that you can write about later. So things that you know a lot about, like if you have read all of Jane Austen's novels, then you have you know, fertile ground for developing a later headline idea title that you could expand into a piece. Example of a poetic form or place to find funny poetry. You know what, I actually hear that a lot of um, poetic outlets and lit mags actually are looking for funny poetry, like maybe not like um, slapping your knees kind of funny, uh, but things that have an element of humor to them. Um, so I would look at you know, the regular kinds of outlets that you enjoy for poetry and see if they'd be open to anything humorous. Otherwise, it sort of depends. Sometimes McSweeney's publishes poetry that's funny, usually when it's very consciously echoing a form of something like Shakespeare. Um, but I'm not, I, off the top of my head, I don't know any other places naturally to place that. Great question. And if anybody in the room at the library has any questions, feel free to walk up to the computer and either unmute yourself or uh, you can uh, type as well. All right, well, that's all I have for you today. Biggest thing, read a poet, read, no, don't read, I mean, read poetry, but not, you know, read humor, read as much humor as you can get your hands on. Um, think about ways to use your language really specifically and clearly and have fun with it. Uh, often the best pieces come from places that you know really deeply and are nerdy about and embrace that, see where it goes. I look forward to seeing your humor in the future, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>